Hey, welcome everyone to All Things Evangelism. I'm here with my friend, uh, Pastor Justin uh, Tarosian. What's up, guys? Yeah, our topic uh, today in uh, our podcast is uh, we're talking about the importance of believing what we believe. And I'm really excited, uh, Justin, to have a conversation uh, about this topic. Yeah, same. We're interested, because you're an evangelist and I'm an evangelism director, in uh, winning souls for Christ. Mm. And this idea of believing what we believe uh, and its importance, uh, I think it's, it's vital. So um, we've just been sitting here talking uh, about uh, what to talk about. <laughs> 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 and we were wishing we had the record button on yeah. <laughs> uh, because the Spirit spoke a bit. Mm. Let's have a short prayer with our church family and we'll ask God to be with us now uh, and lead us again. Yeah, let's pray. God, please bless us. We trust in you, we lean on you, and we know that if we're going to make any judgments, come to any conclusions, we need to do it on the basis of the Word of God, as Jesus said in John 12. Yes. So God us with the Spirit into truth and into a better understanding of how to be who you've called us to be so that we can do what you have called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, brother, so why is it important to believe what we believe, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a great question. And I think uh, an, an important question to tag onto that is, why is it important to believe truth? Right? Because there are a lot of things that we can believe and there are a lot of things that people do believe, but just because you believe it does not make it truth. But once you know that what you believe is true, yeah. that it's founded on scripture, that it's rich and meaningful and it's grounded in God's word and it gives us a right conception of not only our world, but the grand scheme of eternity, mm -hmm. you know, this great controversy, this battle between good and evil, once we know that truth, we should know what it is, not only intellectually, yeah. uh, but we should grasp it and hold on to it with both hands, as it were, really love it, because um, yeah. once we're convinced and convicted that what we believe is indeed truth, it doesn't mean we have all of the answers for every aspect of every question that ever comes mm -hmm. up in regards to the Bible, but once we're convinced that what we believe is true, then there's nothing really that matters more. Yeah, it's almost like you're, you're, you're going to share what you really truly believe is true better than if you're just sharing something that you know, you're not confident is true. Is oh, absolutely. Of, did I say that right? Absolutely, yeah. 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 So yeah, that's it. Hey, so if you don't, if, if you're not, I've had a friend, he's a preacher, and he used to say, are you convicted on this issue or mm. that issue is like, is, is your belief based on your convictions or hmm. is it based on your preferences? Hmm. And he used to say there's a huge difference between preference and conviction. Conviction comes from God through the power of the Holy Spirit and God convicts you of what's true. And that can be confirmed by the word of the living God, hmm. which was inspired by the same spirit. Amen. That's and a so great point. If you're going to be an effective witness for God, your beliefs have to be based on convictions from God's spirit. Absolutely. And yeah. you have to be, yeah. And it totally comes across, I mean, in other areas of life as well, doesn't it? When yeah. someone doesn't really fully believe what they're pitching to you, what they're telling you, yeah. if they're not really uh, on fire. I mean, just a negative example of this. This is why cult leaders are so convincing, right? It's because totally. they fully <laughs> are deceived by what they're preaching is truth. They fully believe yeah. what they're telling people to the point that it's contagious. And the people are like, oh, wow, you know, that conviction, that, yeah. that can, being convinced of, of truth. It must be true because look at the level of passion with which they're proclaiming this. They carry, no matter how ridiculous their viewpoints, they carry people with their conviction. Yeah, yeah that's good. Dude, um, Marshall Herf Applewhite, so the famous uh, Heaven's Gate cult leader mm, yeah. in uh, maybe Southern California. I think it was in, Cor right. not, I don't know where it was, somewhere in S Southern California in the 1990s. Right. So basically, for those of you guys who have never heard of this guy, he is a cult leader and he's convinced that there's a spaceship that's following a comet that was recently hey, identified comet. that was cruising by the planet. Yeah. It was the Hale Bob comet. Mm -hmm. I remember it all. I remember seeing that comet from the middle of the Pacific Ocean because mm -hmm. I was in the Navy at the time. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> and uh and it was like a big deal. And they called it the Hale Bob comet because mm -hmm. the guy, two men had discovered it. One's last name was Hale, the other's last name was Bop. I think mm -hmm. that's the story. It's yeah. something like that. Yep. So um, yeah, man. So he convinces, I don't know. 12, 15, just like a handful of people, highly educated, very intelligent people, yeah. that there's a spaceship following in the wake of this comet. 
and that if they kill themselves just at the right time, just when the comet's like phew, passing over, that they'll be immediately uh, brought up into this spacecraft and that spacecraft will take them to heaven and that's their one opportunity to go mm. into eternity. Mm. And, uh, and they found all of these people, including the cult leader, dead. Yeah. And uh, when you see videos of the guy, he just had this kind of, I don't know what you'd call it, this kind of like, this look on his face where he gave you no choice but to believe he was crazy mm. or he was telling the truth, like, yeah. you know, because he was so convinced about it. And mm. He was able to get rational, educated yeah. adults. Who yeah, had successful nice homes individuals, and families. professionals, and totally. middle to upper class people. Totally. Yeah. Um, and, and it's like he was, I wouldn't want to say he was convicted because the Holy Spirit didn't give him conviction, but he believed, or at least he was committed to what he said he believed. Yeah, in definitely. And this is another reason why it's so important to know that what we believe is true. Right. Because you can fully believe something that's error. Many people do. And just your passion and zeal in believing that it's true doesn't make it true, of course. Right. Um, it just makes you passionately believing it, right? <laughs> passionate right. in it. But, um, well, you know, that, that reminds me of 2 Thessalonians 2, around verse like 11 or 10 or something, where Paul says... I actually had the Bible open to oh, share so it later on. Go? Yeah, yeah. Share it. Read no, it. No, no, no. Go no, for no, it. you got your Bible yeah, this, open. Uh, it's, um, yeah, basically verse 10... It says that to those who perish, or who die, of course, it says perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Yeah. And so I think that's so powerful. You were leading into this for a good reason, though. So well, I was, just thinking, what I was thinking. thinking to myself because it's like, in, if you don't receive a love of the truth, then God will send you a strong delusion so that you will believe a lie. Mm. So Marshall Herf Applewhite, I have to believe if the word of God is true, had at some point become um, impacted or influenced by the truth. You know, the Holy Spirit was speaking to his heart as, it's, as he's speaking to everyone's heart. Yeah. And uh, Romans 8.16 says that the Holy Spirit of God testifies with our spirits that we are the sons of God. And the Spirit, Jesus said, is, is sent to the world to guide us into all truth mm. and to convince us of our sins and God's righteousness and the judgment to come. Yeah, and right. so if we're resisting the Holy Spirit and not developing a love for the truths that the Spirit reveals to us through the course of our lives, then we're in essence saying to God, I don't want it. Yeah. And He'll just leave us to our own devisings and send us a strong delusion so that we can believe a lie because that's what we want. Mm. And so, yeah, like I think it's important that we establish in our own minds a love for what's true. Mm. And the Bible says that... Uh, that the word is the truth. That's right. Yeah, in, John, in John 17, 7. 17. Jesus right. praying to the Father said, Sanctify them through uh, the truth. Thy word is truth. Your word is the truth. Yeah. And it's interesting because because we should... It's crazy. If there's a God and if He's communicated Himself to humanity, then what He has communicated is true. Mm. And it's more true than what we see, what yeah. we feel, what we perceive, what we can deduce, what we can extrapolate from our scientific observations. It's true because if he's the creator and the designer and the sustainer and the one who has all knowledge and, and all understanding, then what he says is going to be more accurate than mm. what we could per perceive, you know? So Absolutely. it's like, if you believe in God and, he, and you believe that he inspired the Bible, then the Bible's the truth. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that God doesn't just say, hey, the Bible is my word because it says so. Um, and so believe it, blind faith, that's it. Yeah. He actually gives us lots of external evidence to support scripture. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we could spend another podcast or like a whole series talking about some of those, but areas yeah. like uh, the Bible's historical statements about these various kings, King Sargon, King Belshazzar of Daniel 5, King David. Archaeology had no evidence. We had no evidence for these guys outside of the Bible for a long time. And skeptics were like, hey, those people didn't really exist. The Bible's making it up. And then inevitably, yeah. um, archaeologists discover, you know, uh, support for all of these individuals and entire nations like the Hittites that weren't found anywhere except the Bible. And mm -hmm. you got scientific statements and statements on health. And all of these are being validated by, uh, you know, what we see today. And so I think it's so powerful that God has something in his word that appeals to every skill set, every mm -hmm. Uh, passion and interest level that people have, even scientists. And yeah. many people don't realize mathematics, there's actually quite a bit of math in the Bible as well. But these things, God gives us these external verifiers mm -hmm. to prove that when we base, when we believe that the Bible is His Word, that it is truth, mm -hmm. that we're not just jumping out in blind faith, but we right. actually have solid evidence upon which to base that faith. Totally. 
So good. So, man, this is hectic. I um, have thought a lot about Adventism and its evangelistic mission, right? We believe mm-hmm. as a church movement, as a church body, that uh, the three angels' messages are committed to our church in particular to preach, that we have been organized and mobilized by God for the purpose of preaching those, those messages of the three angels of yes. Revelation 14 yeah. and their accompanying biblical doctrines, right? Um, right. And so I, I've just thought it's really important for us as Adventists to believe what we believe mm. or else we're not going to be successful in evangelize peop- evangelizing on behalf of what we believe. Absolutely. So it's like, how can I if I am an employee of a particular company, really serve that company's mission well when I don't believe in the mission of that company. Yeah, that's right. right. Absolutely. Like, I'm, I'm actually going to, it really, by the way, it's unethical for me to stay an employee of that that's company true. if I can't serve its mission. But I can't, I can't expect that I'm going to be uh, an asset to the company, nor, nor could the company expect that I'm going to in any way help it in its accomplishment of its goals, right, or in its mission statement. Mm. And so I feel like it's important why, like we've titled this, The Importance of Believing What We Believe, Mm. because we can't win people to what we don't believe in. That's so true. (laughs) This is is our church. This is what we believe. (laughs) You know, and so if a person, firstly, I would say if a person doesn't believe the fundamental teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we're a representative church, which means... Mm that our leaders represent us, and we have all agreed as a church body that we believe the 28 fundamentals, as stated in the 28 fundamentals. That's right. And so that's what we believe. That's what defines who we are. And if you don't believe that, you have an ethical obligation to leave. Mm, It's true. It's not a social club. It's not a social club. But, of course, it's, it is a community, and it's more than that. I'm not yeah. trying to say that that's, that's everything of that course, we are. Yeah. But that's fundamentally what we believe. Mm. And we as a church you know, community can expect that we're going to succeed in winning people, you know, and I should say winning people into the faith of Christ, which we believe is the faith of the, uh, the biblical faith of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, mm. um, if we don't believe like, yeah, our teachings. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, if someone who's listening right now is, is kind of considering that and thinking, well, I don't know if I agree with this of the 28 fundamental beliefs, um, I just want to challenge you. I'm not saying you. believe, by the way. Oh, no, I'm, of course. <laughs> I'm just but if that. anyone is in that, that boat, like, dig deep. Study it out, you know? Don't yeah. be satisfied to just uh, take somebody's word for it and something that you said. I mean, yeah. it's so important to know that what we believe is indeed truth. And like you're saying, you know, when we are convicted and convinced that what we believe is the truth, it mm-hmm. transforms the way that we operate. It transforms everything about our lives, really. Yep. And we want to reach out naturally to others. And I'm not saying don't ask, ask questions. Uh, yeah. I'm just saying be honest and be decent. Mm-hmm. And, you know, especially if you're a denominational employee, like a pastor, how could you take a tithe check, you know, take a payment uh, uh, from people who are paying to forward and advance the Adventist mission when you don't even believe the Adventist teachings? And so somebody might respond, oh, yeah, you're just somebody who's trying to create a, in context in an environment where people can't ask honest questions. Mm. No, uh, not, not at all. I'm just saying people should be honest. Mm. And if they have questions, study, That's like right. for real, like yeah. study uh, and, uh, and surrender yourself to the Word of God. Yeah. And if you don't, like for me personally, like if I really truly didn't believe in, a, in, a, in some of the teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I, I wouldn't waste my time being in this church as a mm. member. Like, yeah. I just don't see why anyone would. I, I just don't even get it. I would yeah. just go find a church that I believed was teaching the truth. Because, yeah, you know, it's, <laughs> so there's a text in 1 Timothy 3.15. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting passage of Scripture. So it says um, in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, he's, he says, first in verse 14, he says, I am writing these things to you, Paul to Timothy, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how to conduct yourself in the house of the living God, which is the church, the pillar and the support of the truth. And some Mm. versions say the pillar and the ground or the foundation of the truth. So according to Paul, what is the church of the living God? It's the pillar, basically the foundation. What do pillars and and foundations do? 
They hold buildings they hold up. up. Yeah. Okay. So the Church of the Living God holds up the truth. Mm. And, and more than that, it's the foundation of the truth. Yeah. So if I'm in a, in a church organization, a church movement that's teaching what's fundamentally untrue about God, that's lying about God, that's misrepresenting conscience. God, yeah. how could you in good conscience stay in that movement? That's right. You follow what I'm saying? You're Absolutely. just not an ethical person who's true to your own conscience. Mm. So I'm just saying you just be true to your conscience. And like, like I couldn't be a member of the Baptist church because I don't think God tortures people and never stops. Yeah. And I couldn't lend my influence to that movement, that organization, although I respect and regard their commitment to Jesus and what they know about Jesus and their sincere faith, those who have it in him. They're my brothers and sisters on a spiritual level. Right. But how could you participate in that you know, organization's mission? It's true. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And you definitely wouldn't be strong yeah. in your participation, that's for sure. Absolutely. You know, I think I'm not connect, communicating the way I wish I was, but I hope <laughs> no, no, no one I, misunderstands me out I'll there. Follow. I think everyone will understand as well. Like, you can't be a part of a movement or a church that um, is giving an erroneous picture of God, like a God who tortures people forever, yeah. and you can't believe that conscientiously because as you've studied Scripture, you've That's come you to, believe. yeah, you find that it teaches a very different thing about the character of our loving God. You know, I think part of the challenge that we face as a church is that when we are converted, Everyone who's genuinely converted, they learn the truth, and they're like, wow, this is incredible. So they learn the, the, the truth intellectually from the Bible. They apply it to the lot, their lives. The Holy Spirit helps them apply it to their lives. They come in contact with Jesus, who is the living truth, mm -hmm. right? The way, the truth, and the life, and it affects their lives. And um, often, not always, but often what happens with people is that after that point, their fire may grow dimmer and dimmer. Maybe they're weak in their devotional life and they're not remaining connected to Christ and coming in contact with Him. They're not keeping the relationship with Him strong. And as a result, say three years, four years, five years down the line, they're in the habit of going to church, which is a good thing, of course. Yes. They might even go to prayer meeting every once in a while. Um, they might do outreach every once in a while. But really, like they have the intellectual knowledge of the truth in their heads still that they learned but they actually have grown so distant from the, the living truth, Jesus Christ, that they have no zeal, yeah. no desire to share, no desire to, no burden for others who don't know Jesus to learn, but they are comfortable and think, oh, hey, I'm fine because I know the truth. I understand yeah. this doctrine and this doctrine and this doctrine. And so I guess I think, you know, that you see this happen and um, it can happen with any of us, of course. Yeah. But so it's like losing your first love. Message to the Church of Ephesus: exactly. You've lost your first love. Yeah. So you you're not you, you haven't, haven't lost, lost your, your knowledge, your grasp of certain ideas, but you've lost your heart for them. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, perfect example. I was talking to uh, a, a guy who um, his name's Junior. He lives locally, and uh, he's going to be baptized soon. He came into contact with us through the end, the series of evangelistic presentations that were done a few months ago here that are still online. And uh, he just told me yesterday as we were on the phone together, he said, listen, I was talking to my Adventist coworker, and, and I just, I told her, like, I just can't enjoy the thought of heaven when so many people here are going to miss out because they haven't accepted the gospel. Mm. And I was like, man, thank you, Lord. I told him, I said, you know what that is, Junior? It's called a burden for souls. Wow. You have this wow. desire for others to know what a precious friend you have found in Jesus. And there's something in you that can't be satisfied, that can't be uh, happy about the thought of heaven until as many people as possible uh, are able to accept Jesus as their Savior as wow. well through your influence and your effort. And so I said, don't lose that. And um, you're going to start joining us on, on Bible studies to mm -hmm. share you know, these beautiful truths that you've learned and that you've let God change your life through. It's almost like this guy has like the whole James thing. It's like the practical, living, real faith. Mm. And it's like where that, that one statement where he says, even the devils believe and tremble, like in mm. chapter two, I think it's chapter two. And it, he, so he's like, okay, so the demons have this knowledge of the truth and of God and of his will, and it makes them shake and mm. tremble. So they've got a deep enough understanding that, that it physically affects them but they're not profited yeah. because they're not surrendered to it. They're not living in active communion with God, like yeah. on a servant level, submitting to the will of God. Mm. And so it's like it's a similar kind of a concept. So this guy's got this living experience with God so that he has this energy and this passion in his witness 
that's affecting how he lives his life mm. versus, and I could honestly confess, like for sure, me and my life, I've fully lost, I, I, I catch myself, I feel like I haven't lost my first love. I lose, I keep losing it. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. like over I, and over. I hear you. <laughs> where you just kind of get stale. Mm. And I believe, but it's like the man of uh, Mark 9. Mm. I believe, but God help my unbelief. Yeah. Like help me to believe what I believe, like for real. Amen, amen, mm. absolutely. You know, I think another aspect of what we believe, you know, just the Bible talks about the importance of sharing the gospel and reaching out to those who don't know the Lord. Uh, I mean, perfect example, the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you were lost and you had no idea that there was a heaven and that there was going to be a new earth, that God had was preparing eternity for you, mm -hmm. um, if you were in, like, if you and I were in that place, and we knew that somebody else knew it, we would want them to come to us and share it with us, to right? Help us, yeah. And so that's the ultimate epitome of the golden rule: is to share with those who don't know the Lord and grant them the opportunity at accepting the gift of eternal life. Mm -hmm. But as that's the natural outflow of believing what we believe, and it moves us to action, right? It moves our feet to action. Um, I think that uh, we we often are so fearful. Like, how do we reach out? And um, about six weeks ago, our Bible worker, actually a local missions volunteer, Ryan, he, was, um, he hadn't been door knocking for a little while. And he said, uh, I think he was doing a lot with uni because he's a student half time. And he said, you know, I've got to get out door knocking. I, he just had this burden that he needed to get back out and connecting with people in the community. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, this was his first day back. He knocked on this lady's door and uh, she answered and she was on the phone. And he was like, oh no, people on the phone almost always just shut you down, right? <laughs> Close the door in your face. He said to her, oh, listen, I'm just from the church down the way, but I, I won't take much of your time. Just wanted to, you know, give you our, you know, this card to invite you to, uh, you know, whatever it was. I think he was sharing cards for our food pantry just quickly so that he could say goodbye. And she's like, oh no, I'll hang up, come in. And he's like, okay. So he came in and um, this lady, uh, asked him, you know, what brings you to knock on my door, you mm. know? And she was kind of looking at him, I think, like, what, you know, what was it that motivated yeah, yeah. you to come out here today? And after he told her that we're from the local Seventh-day Adventist church, uh, she said, listen, this morning at 3 a.m., I've been battling with some things in my life. I couldn't sleep. It was 3 a.m. And I finally cried out to God and said, God, if, <laughs> if you can help me, then please send someone to help me. If you're nice. up there, send someone to help me. Wow. And that day... Ryan knocked on her door and an answer to her prayer. Heavy. And, um, you Heavy. know, I just bring this up to say when we really believe the truth, we'll want to share it. And when we're faithful to share it, we may be an answer to someone's prayers. Mm -hmm. You know, so many stories of call porters and people who've knocked on people's doors as an answer to their prayer. Um, I've heard some, I have a friend who knocked on someone's door. They were about to end their life. And, you know, they literally went to answer the door as they were about to end their life and they just broke down crying, realizing God was reaching out to them in love. You just reminded me of something I haven't thought about for years, dude. I was in New, New Mexico. This is crazy. When I, I'd been an Adventist for maybe five years and I was out in the community following up lead cards from canvassers that had, mm. had kind of done canvassing ministry. And, I, and, I, and when I would go to someone's house to make the most of my time, I would just knock on their neighbor's door and I'd say, hey, I just, I just stopped by your friend Phil's house and I'm just doing whatever. Anyways, mm. just, just trying to see if anyone was interested. Yeah. So I knock on this girl's door. It was crazy. And she was like fully an abuse victim. Mm. Like she was fully like getting beat up and stuff. Mm. And uh, it wasn't, this is not a positive story because it didn't, it, but it just shows you never know. Mm. And, and, and it's like, she was a beautiful, maybe mid 20 year old girl, maybe late mm. 20s. And, and she's looking at me and she has this look and I'm like, hey, my name's Matt, I'm with Youth for Jesus, we're out mm. in the community. And she's like, ah, oh, yeah, I don't know if I can talk to you right now. But she wasn't mm. saying it like, go away. She was like, yeah. I don't know if I can talk about it. She's kind of crying. Mm. Mm. And I was like, do you need, and I just like, I stopped, no spiel, no, I'm a Bible guy. It was like, do you need my help? Mm. Can I help you? Mm. And she's like, yes, I, no. And, and she was like fully, and there's wow, a guy behind man. her like, hey, well, who is that? Oh, and I'm like, man. do you need me to help you right now? Mm. It's like, I I'm here. I'll help you. Mm. And she's like, oh, thank you so much. And, and she's crying. She's oh, like, well, I, I can't. And she closes the door. Mm. It mm. was hectic. Oh, man. Wow. So God wow. fully sent me, and I could have helped her, you know. Like mm. I, I would have fully mm. just snatched her out of the house and taken her to the cops and helped her, you know. Mm. But wow. Um, wow. It, was, it was crazy. 
No, it was kidding, crazy. Man. Hey, so we that's never... uh, so check this out, bro. I'm seeing that we're talking about two topics, not two topics, but like we're addressing this topic of believing what you believe in two ways. Mm. Like number one, Adventists have to believe in Adventist teaching if they want to be successful in Adventist evangelism. Right. I think that yeah. follows logically and yeah. biblically too. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> Further to that, just in general, Christians and believers should have a living faith mm. that's solid in its commitment to God and, and it's living and real rather than just some intellectual assent to yeah, ideas. definitely. So do you want to comment real quickly, bro? Because you, you said this was a good thing to share before, mm. but we were talking about the idea of the Greek versus Hebrew yes. concepts of belief. Yes, that's a great way to put it. And I think um, something mentioned earlier just about how um oh man it just totally slipped my mind but the aspect of having a knowledge yes that's it an intellectual knowledge of the truth uh and thinking that we're fine versus having a an intellectual knowledge that translates to our hearts and a living experience in the truth. And I've never heard it summarized in contrasting the Greek and the Hebrew mindset. But yeah you know I thought that was something familiar to you. So okay in Greek thinking to believe was to be able to ascend intellectually yeah. to an idea. So I could grasp that idea on a, on a, on a level, and on, that a, was, on a mental level. That was all that mattered. On an really. intellectual level, and so therefore I believe it. Yeah. That's like the Greek notion of believing, but the Hebrew concept, the Hebrew notion of belief was tied to the idea of acceptance and, and um, acquiescence too. So mm. it's, it's I hear, I obey, I it do. becomes I do. It's yeah. a part of my life. It's a more practical idea. Mm, yeah. It's a more re, like tangible idea of belief. So, and this is by the way in the book of Hebrews when you read Hebrews chapter three and four you'll notice like on two or three occasions Paul he he uses the word obedience and the word faith mm. like interchangeably. Mm, so he'll say yeah. the Israelites didn't enter into the promised land because they didn't obey, and then he'll say it's because they didn't believe. Yeah. You know, to so use those two concepts, which reflects the Hebrew notion of belief. Very true. Versus what we the believe. Greek notion. And yeah. I think in modern Christianity, due to just the history of the church, we have mingled our view of belief with the Greek. I think we have more of a Greek concept of believing. And so mm. you're saying we need to believe like the Bible's telling us to believe, yeah. not like the Greeks believe, just Absolutely. ascending to concepts and then going, I believe. But, yeah. but really, it, not according to the Bible, you don't believe. That's right. And belief, as the Bible teaches, always translates to action. You know, and I think um, I heard a title of a sermon, never listened to the sermon, but it was uh, preached by Joe Cruz back in the day. It was called Missing Heaven by 18 Inches. And it gives you this mental picture of someone, you know, like just on the ground reaching out, uh, just reaching out as the gate of heaven just swings shut, you know, kakong, you know, you're stuck outside. Um, But the reason for the title of this sermon is because 18 inches is the average distance from the human head to the human heart. Oh, interesting. So a lot of people, his point was, a lot of people will miss heaven by 18 inches because they knew the truth intellectually, but they didn't let it seep into their hearts. They didn't have a, wow. love, a love for the truth. And therefore, right. as a result, you know, they would, yep. they would be lost. So, dude, I want to say something to our listeners. Jesus says in John 14, 6, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus was saying that he was the embodiment of God's truth. So he was the personification of the oh, truth. Yeah, I himself. am the way, the truth. And I life. am the way, the tr- that's actually what it says in John 14, 6. I'm, I'm quoting John 8, sorry. John 8, 32, I said that oh, all wrong. All good. It's John 8, 32. Jesus says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And he says in John 14, I am the way, mm-hmm. I am the truth. So he's the, he's right. the embodiment of the truth. Um, but the scripture is the written uh, truth. It's the, tr- mm. it's the truth that comes from God that's articulated in words. Yes versus it being communicated and expressed through a person. And there should be no discord between the two. So the Bible says, sanctify them by thy truth, thy word is the truth. So Mm. the written word of God is the truth. The living word of God is the truth, right? So there's a true record of Jesus written in scripture. And there's a true, like, I should say there is a, God's truth is written in scripture as God's truth was lived in Jesus. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so... But there's no discord between the living truth in Jesus and the written truth. So there are certain teachings and doctrines in Scripture. And the Bible says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Um, 
I think it's important that people come to a knowledge of the truth. Yeah, absolutely. And if they come to a knowledge of what's true doctrinally, theologically, well, then they're freed from error, mm. from wrong ideas. Yeah. So I am subject to deceptions of Satan if I don't know the truth about the state of the dead. Yeah. I don't understand the, the true power of sin unless I understand the truth of the state of the dead. That's right. Right? Like, yeah. I don't understand what Jesus overcame unless I understand the truth of the state of the dead. I don't understand the character of God if I don't understand the truth of punishment and that mm. there is punishment, but it's not like this eternal protracted punishment that yeah. never stops. Like, mm. that's not biblical. That's not true. And when people are wrapped up in those errors, the Bible says they're drunk because mm. Babylon has fallen because it made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, which is just false teaching. So it's, it's mm. made people intoxicated with false concepts of God and, and false ideas about God and false doctrines. Mm. They confuse you emotionally, psychologically, and they confuse your behavior because you practice wacky behavior when you have crazy ideas mm. and crazy doctrines in your head. That's true. So if you're going to be an Adventist, you should believe Adventist teaching, and you're not going to succeed evangelistically unless you preach the doctrinal truth. And if you preach the doctrinal truth and you really don't believe it or see its value, then you're not going to be successful in converting yeah. people to a knowledge of that truth. And a knowledge of that truth is important. And of course, you're not supposed to just have a rigid academic knowledge of truth that should be living. But that doesn't mean necessarily, that it doesn't mean the truth isn't important. Mm. I think this is where we kind of get, we throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. Just because there's Pharisees, doesn't mean that the doctrine of the resurrection is bad because the Pharisees believed it. You know, yeah, so it's like right. the Apostle Paul is not, he was a Pharisee by training, but he became a Jesus-centered apostle. Mm. But then he writes 1 Corinthians 15, which is this doctrinal treatise on the resurrection. Yeah, so he right. doesn't throw out the doctrines of the Pharisees just because the Pharisees were Pharisees and related to doctrine inappropriately. And so I think this is a lesson for us, right? Like our doctrines are important and we should believe them. And if you don't believe them, then uh, no wonder why you're not converting people to the Adventist <laughs> faith, yeah. right? Like yeah. it's just, it's just. Uh, you can't it, share just, what you don't have. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. Anyway. And you know, I think part of what you mentioned as well, it, it goes to show like intellectually understanding the truths of the Word of God is is essential, right? Yeah. But there are people and there are professors who are Bible quote unquote Bible professors. Yeah. in different secular universities in the United States, and I'm sure across the world, who treat the Bible like a piece of literature, and they don't believe it's inspired by God, and the Bible has no saving power for them. And just like the demons, like you mentioned earlier, how it mentions in James that the devils even believe and tremble, right? Um, they believe because they know intellectually who God is. They were in His presence before, but they don't have a saving faith. It's the same with the information found in the Bible. If we allow information to come into our minds from the Bible and we study and we learn it, but we don't allow the Holy Spirit to help us apply it in our lives, mm -hmm. then that information without spirit-led application just leads to greater condemnation. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, we knew better, right? Mm -hmm. Yet we didn't surrender to the Spirit's leading. However, the opposite is true as well. If we devour what the Bible teaches, we embrace the truth not only with our minds, but in our hearts, Yep. we allow the Spirit to apply it to our lives, then information with Spirit-led application will lead to life transformation yes. and ultimately to salvation. Amen. And then to the salvation of others because we're going to want to evangelize That's and right. share the gospel with those around us. Totally, totally. And I, I really feel that like Babylon is fallen is fallen. And, you know, Babylon was a center of idolatry, which idolatry at its, at its very core is, is just physical representations of false concepts of God. Mm, that's true. And doc false doctrines are false concepts of God, or yeah. teachings that give you a false conception of God. That's right. And so when the Bible says Babylon has fallen in the New Testament, it's just simply saying that, that people, you know, that, that the church itself, that the, that the Christian church itself has become Babylonish. It teaches false concepts of God through its false doctrines. And our job as an organization and as a ministry and as a movement is to free people mm, from that right. by giving them the pure word of God, yeah. unadulterated, Amen. you know. Amen. We preach the word in season and out of season. Um, we, we just proclaim the truth with all, in all of its glory. Jesus says, teaching them all things whatsoever mm. I have commanded you. Amen. All things, everything. Yeah. The unadulterated word of God, 
you know, you just preach it, you proclaim it, and you free the world from the deception and the mm. delusions of Babylon. And, you know, it's funny because we in the West, we're always just like, which is good. We're always talking about the crimes of uh, the colonists and the imperial, mm. uh, imperialistic British Empire and all that stuff. Like, and the way that we treated the indigenous peoples, but we never piece together why that would have been the case. Like, mm. And I think it's really simple. It's because their theological concepts were wrong. Yeah, like, they right. were crazy. Very so true. it's like this idea of, um, of determinism, right? Like Calvinistic determinism. This idea that God has consigned some to damnation and he just created them to destroy them. And then others, he created them to live forever. And it's completely arbitrary. Mm. And it has to be arbitrary because that's grace. For somehow they calculate that that's grace, right? That's the only way you can get to grace, right? Hmm. And so, okay, so you're a Western European who's gone through the Industrial Revolution, who reads Socrates and Aristotle and the apostles, epistles of Paul, and you find a group of Aboriginal Australians who like drink, you know, water out of the backsides of toads, and live in a primitive Stone Age setting. Which, do, do, who do you think you're going to think God consigned to damnation? You or them? Mm. Yeah, them, of course. And who are you going to think God has mindset. predetermined to be his elect? Mm. You or them? Yeah. You. Yourself. Yeah. So why would these people feel perfectly justified mm. in treating aboriginals as horribly as they did? Well, it's because they're doctrines. Mm. Right? So true. And the Inquisition as well. The Inquisition you know, as well. Totally. Torturing people and That's saying, it. oh, well, if they... If they convert after a year of torture, I saved them a thousand years in hell or I've done them a favor. an eternity in hell, so I'm actually the good totally. guy. It's I killed your kids, twisted. took away your house, mm. and I'm helping you. Yeah, And Crazy. this is the wine of Babylon. Mm. The wine of Babylon. And so mm. that's why the true doctrines are so important. And what you're saying, bro, I want to say this is the last thing I'm going to say, and then you can close the show for us. I knew this kid just... So once again, we're talking about, from what I could gather, Justin, I'm seeing the vein of our conversation. The one vein is Adventists should be believe Adventist teaching. And if they truly believe it, they'll preach it effectively. Mm. And they'll help people to see it's important. On the other hand, all believers, whatever their faith persuasion, if they're true, genuine believers in Christ, wherever they fall on the doctrinal spectrum, um, and uh, they, they, and I guess we're speaking to Adventists primarily, mm. is our belief should be practical, real, heart-based, not just some kind of academic exercise mm. where we kind of get the right answers. Yeah. Okay, so I knew this kid named, speaking to your to that point, not your point, but that point, I knew this kid named Curtis Labriola, and he, um, I met him in California, and he was such a radical kid, and he did have some mental health issues, but at the same time, man, he was pretty out there for God, and I think his faith was so sincere. He... Um, used to go down into the valley and he'd give away all of his stuff because he just mm. felt like, man, you know, you got these homeless people and people out of work and I've got to go down there and give away my stuff. Mm. And so he'd go down there and give away his shoes, his shirt, he'd give away his pants, he'd give away everything. He'd find like a homeless guy who could wear his pants and he'd take his pants off. Mm. And sometimes his mom would call me and be like, yeah, he just got back from the valley and yeah, he's just in his underwear and his feet are all burned up because mm. he's been walking on the hot. California wow. pavement with no shoes on because mm. it gives them away to the homeless people. Wow. And he, I'd find out that he would like go to like rich neighborhoods and he got, he got picked up by the cops a couple of time, mm. times because he'd go to these rich neighborhoods with his underwear on and be like, he'd start to pre, he'd knock on the door of the rich people and then he'd like say, hey, I've just given away all my clothes. Mm. You know, my feet are burning and my, I've got nothing and mm. I'm a poor kid from the mountain and you know, you're living in this big house. How can you live with yourself? Mm. You know, when you know that there's people starving and dying and, and mm. out in your own streets and you're just sitting here living the life and God's watching you, you know, mm. and you, can, you just need to repent. And wow. Okay, church family, I'm not giving this story to endorse Cat <laughs> Curtis's methods necessarily. <laughs> he, was a bit, he was a bit unstable mentally, and I'm not saying you should ever do that, you know. Um, those rich people could have given away millions, mm. and he has no idea, right? Yeah. And they could be making money to give away money, and they could be owning businesses that provide employment. And, you know, so I'm not saying that he was right. He was a young kid who was stupid, and he didn't know anything about the world. But I'm just making, I'm just telling his story a bit because even though I knew he was unstable and doing a lot of wrong things, I was always very impressed with his willingness 
to just do whatever he thought God was asking him to do. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. to go down into a town and give away all your clothes to homeless people and walk home 50 kilometers on a hot paved road so that your feet burn up in mm-hmm. California sun, mm-hmm. which is like the equivalent of like 40 degree temperature yeah. here. Um, It's a beautiful thing, you know, and Mm. I I think God used that kid in magnificent ways. I saw him bring more people to church than I saw Mm. stable, balanced, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, well-educated Adventists doing for God, and Mm. um, that's not a slight to that, that those people. But you get the point. So, anyways, man, he was awesome, man. He was an inspiration. He was a huge rebuke to me. Mm. Mm. But if God can't get the refined and ennobled, he'll just get the kid from the trailer park who's mentally unstable. Mm. Because at least something will happen then. Yeah, amen. I mean, if he's, if he's that on fire for the Lord that he's just wanting to give up his time and all of his substance to help the needy, I mean, that's yeah. how we should all be as, yeah, as unreal. followers of Christ. I think just the last thought that I'll share is just a, a quote from someone who we started studying the Bible with a few weeks ago. But before that, I think that as Seventh-day Adventists, when we really believe what we believe, Let's just even just take the two in our name. The seventh day is the Sabbath, and that at the end of time, it'll be a special test for the world. Um, that's where seventh day Adventists, right? And then Adventists, Jesus coming is near. He's coming soon. Like when we really believe that with all of our hearts, it will affect the way we live. Uh, like Curtis, mm-hmm. like the story you're mentioning, yeah. um, was studying, I think last week or the week before with a, uh, a med school student here in Newcastle. A really sincere young man, and um, he uh, he said with a Bible in his hands, as we were uh, as we were in the middle of our study, he said, as he held up his Bible, he energetically said, "If this is true, then I don't want to do anything else. How can I do anything else with my time, my energy?" Like he was even thinking, maybe I change my my studies to to be in ministry full time. Mm-hmm. And I said, listen, brother, that kind of passion, that kind of zeal and commitment that you have, every single Seventh-day Adventist is supposed to have. Many of us do, Mm. but never lose that because as a doctor, you're nearly finished. He's in his last few months of his degree. I said, God wants to use you as a doctor for him. He has many doctors as Seventh-day Adventists and dentists and plumbers and uh, teachers and you name it. Yeah. God needs all of us in our spheres of influence uh, to reach out for Him. But just His proclamation really, it stirred me and it moved me because He's not even, I mean, that was our second Bible study, you know? He's still trying to establish, um, you know, that the Bible is indeed the Word of God. And He's recognizing already, man, yeah. if this is true, then I don't want to be doing anything else. Yeah, wow. And how many of us as, as Adventist Church members have known the truth for years and yet don't have that kind of zeal. Or maybe we once did and we let it fade. We have the Greek method of faith where it's an intellectual thing rather than the living translation of what we believe into mm. our actions in everyday life. But I just want to have that kind of zeal always, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah, never lose Amen. that first love experience. Amen. Thank you, brother Justin, for coming and uh, chatting to me. It's thanks fun for having to, me. It's fun to hang out. And uh, I always Definitely. love to hear your thoughts and, and I really learn from them, and as we all do. Uh, church family, please... Uh, You've listened to this podcast. You're awesome. Praise God. I hope that you've been blessed. But uh, yeah, please um, click on to the email link that can allow you to subscribe to our podcast. We'd love to continue to be able to share with you regularly. And um, let's all remember the man of Mark chapter 9 um, who said to Jesus, Lord, I believe, mm. but please help my unbelief. There's a degree of unbelief in all of us. Yeah. And it's easy for us to lose our first love. Mm -hmm. And may God grant us the gift of full repentance in Jesus' name. May we see him for who he is Mm -hmm. and love him for who he is and respond appropriately to all that he's done for us and to love those who he's given his life uh, to save. Um, God bless you guys, and uh, we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye.